And welcome to a new episode of PR360, and I'm your host, Brett Dicer. If you could please subscribe to PR360 and leave a five-star review on all your favorite podcasting apps, that really does help the show and lets us get to that top of the business category, because that's a huge category in podcasting space. But with me, I have Mauricio, and he has 13 years plus of experience in marketing and including B2C and B2B. So he's got both the best of both worlds. He understands both sides of the spectrum, but he has a background in education, operations, customer service, and product marketing. And he's built and mentored high-performing holistic teams through empowerment, challenging experience, and trust. So welcome to the show, Maurice. Thank, thank you, Brett. I, I don't think I need to do an intro. I think you just did it for me, right? <laughs> Here is I'm like I'm ready, I'm like, but you said it all right there. <laughs> well, I do my best, but sometimes people just want to give a little bit more about what they want, so I give them an. A... No, no, no. That that pretty much covers it, right? Thirteen years, B to B and B to C, right? Um, my journey has covered, like you said, operations, education, um, right through software, hardware, mm-hmm. a variety of different places, manufacturers to SaaS startups. Nice. But I mean, the most important question is going to be, are you a coffee or a tea drinker? Oh, right. I'm both. So that was a funny question that you have. So I'll have an espresso or Americano for the, for the Americano for the morning. And then normally I'll have green tea or, or uh, uh, Earl Grey for the afternoon. So it's just, it's kind of funny you do that. And I do it the English way with the Earl Grey, a little bit of milk involved in that. Nah. Well, you know, it's always interesting to see people's drinking habits, especially PR people <laughs> and marketing people, because it's like, okay, who's the caffeinated person and who's not the caffeinated person? I'm the caffeinated person, and I also love coffee. So, <laughs> how many cups in the day for you? Oh, uh, this is my third one, and it's eleven <laughs> o'clock. I think that if I started drinking more coffee, I think people would kind of put me in a straitjacket and put me away. I'm I'm already pretty highly energy. I energy already. So when I'm on coffee, people kind of give a couple steps back and allow me to bounce the walls a bit. So uh, it, it's been something. Being Colombian, I, I grew up drinking coffee from an early age. So, um, you know, it's all right. I was a late bloomer. I started in like my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. But anyways, speaking of just retail and just the B2B and everything that's been going on the past two years, I mean, you've had supply chain issues and now inflation issues. I mean, how have you messaged your customers? Cause the customers are like, Oh, can I afford this anymore? Are you going to have this in stock anymore? So how do you deliver that message where at least alleviate some of the fears? You can't probably alleviate all the fears, but at least you can alleviate some of them. Right. I mean, we are a living, and the word has been used a lot, unprecedented, right? But um, the idea of, of where we're at today, I mean, I think you can, you can flip a coin and get 50-50 in terms of how economists are looking at, how, how you know, how the marketplaces are looking at, right? I mean, yeah, you're right. Um, inflation is being, you know, we just came out from some, some numbers, and, and, and inflation is definitely uh, a hitting us all over the place. I mean, we saw a little reduction in terms of like some of the volatiles in terms of gas coming down, but uh, yeah, it's a tough call, man. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm thinking about what um, um, uh, an economist was saying. We're kind of an inflection point between, um, I think that wholesalers have seen uh, very good profits. I mean, they saw a bumper year last year. And um, I think that certain markets are seeing I mean, we're looking at companies who overbought, right? You're looking at Target and, and Walmart now looking at a lot of inventory and trying to trying to um, sell off that. So I, it, really, it really depends on what vertical you're in. Um, in terms of like the, the B2B, what I'm looking at is that company, it's not affecting it as much as the retail side. I think in the retail side, you're looking at like, you're seeing a reduction in terms of cars. I mean, there was a big demand in cars, but now you're seeing a, a reduction in the amount of interest in cars just because it's costing a lot more to take out a loan. So um, I'm not sure I, me- I answered that question really well. So, 
I mean, is is there any way to actually like try to message it in a, I guess in a more positive light? It's it's going to be negative no matter what you do. But is there a way to like try to be somewhat positive? Like, hey, we understand your concerns about inflation. We are doing our best to at least bring down the cost, but we also are a business. We have to actually make some revenue or like we understand that it's out of stock, but when we first will make do a queue line or whatever, is there some way of actually doing that to actually alleviate some of the fears and that messaging behind it? I think if you're being transparent with your costs, right? I mean, I think when you're going to, let me just say this, I went to a, a local restaurant and they were pretty transparent in terms of like what their materials are costing, right? So their organic wheat is costing now another 10% more, but they were pretty upfront about it. Um, and I think just being honest with people on that, I think that what we're seeing is, hey, um, customers don't want to be, they don't want to be taken for a ride. Nobody does, right? I mean, if you know that, for instance, Ford's having a big issue with their retailers in terms of selling their cars, they're selling them for $25,000 or more. And customers are like, hey, wait a minute. I don't mind you making a profit. I don't, think, I don't think anyone minds a company making a profit. But being gouged is a different story. So I think you need to be very transparent with your customers and being quite honest with the costs that have gone up. And I think people will appreciate that um, as, as, a, and as another human being. If you're really honest with, with these people and being upfront with them and just saying, look, our cost you enjoy our meal, you enjoy our, our specific types of breads. Well, our costs, we're trying to source out always the best and working with our purveyors and in, in, in providing the best possible um, experience for you. Unfortunately, the cost of this is going up and we're going to have to raise this by five cents or 10 cents. And I think being quite honest with those customers is, is, um, is going to give you a hundred percent. I think the, I think that we, customers just don't want to be taken for a ride. They don't want to be gouged. And I think we're seeing that in terms of gas companies and oil companies and other type of companies who are taking advantage of customers currently um, who are seeing being you know uh, tight uh, on on, uh, on certain costs. I mean, on food costs, um, going out to a restaurants more expensive now. So yeah, that's that's how I would answer that. Gotcha. And then even moving on to the SaaS type of software. I mean, a lot of people, right. including myself, are like, uh, I don't know how many different types of subscriptions I can actually afford. And so right. you have this problem where inflation is really hitting everybody between the small business owners who may have a couple of SaaS softwares. So how do you message that value? Because it's more the value of like, this is what we're providing you. This is why it's costing us that much. Should you be doing that too? Because I'm pretty sure a lot of people are scaling back. Like I'm trying to scale back on Adobe products because I think Adobe is just right. too expensive. Right. The nice thing about, okay, so there's two sides, right? There's the user side and the person who's actually offering it, right? On the user side, I always ask for an audit, right? You're always should audit to see how much you're actually um, using the type of software. I mean, I've been to certain companies where they're using like five different SEO type of SaaS software for, their analytics and the reality of the fact is they're only using one like five percent and most of the the other stuff uh, the other pieces of software 30 or 20 20 percent so you really have to take a look at it and say hey you know do i really need that so i think i think a lot of companies are looking at 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 the you know nickels and dimes right and and seeing hey are we getting the full value of what this particular software is providing for us right so um i think as a SaaS provider um, your job is to, you know, stand above because it may, it, it's kind of interesting because you may have, you may be competing with somebody that you may not know of. They have your software and another software. So your outreach and how you're communicating with, with these people could make the difference when they go ahead and decide, Hey, look, I got a and B, you know, a never really talks to us, but B always comes over and, and is always constantly asking how I'm doing. Their rep is reaching out to me. This guy is just collecting my money. So as I hope that answers both sides of the question. So I think as a SaaS provider, you're really going to have to step up and um, communicate with the people who are using your software and get that feedback mechanism. Right? This is a, I always look at SaaS software when I work at a company as a, you're um, you're in a collaboration with them. Your 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 main goal, I mean, you, it bottom it defines into three things, right? 
my software needs to save you time, save you money, make money. I mean, that's how it boils down to anything, right? So you need to constantly communicate that value prop on how our software is doing these three things and how um, specifically it's doing it for these particular companies, right? And also get to the point where, you know, honestly go to them and say, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not reaching that particular goal. And I think it'd be best for us to, to break that, um, you know, contract with you, which is com completely surprising from the perspective of a u customer or a user. Like, wait, you're the company who would make money off of me, but you're actually telling me that you're probably it'd be not worthwhile to continue. Which I think in the long run, you know, we're looking at the long game of, of relationships with, with our particular, these particular companies. I, I always look at a long game. And I think I think it, it it behooves companies to look at the long game, right? Your long term value of your customer, right? Sometimes it may not be a good relationship with that customer, and it may be a good idea for to to take a break. And the nice thing about SaaS software is that you can take a break. So, for instance, Slack, you may go, you know what? I don't need as many people. I may just go off to the free and work that for a while, and then you know come come across. So we're looking at SaaS companies also experimenting with reverse trials, with freemiums, we're allowing people to revert to uh, a very basic freemium. You know, they get most of what they can go until they get back to on their feet. So we're looking at some SaaS software companies that are doing the particular that and actually seeing a increase in the amount of people who take on the full uh, versions. I mean, could you use like, I don't know, like a pay per type of model too, or could you use like quarterly models? Because I know like right now, a lot of them are like pay monthly or pay yearly. And it's like, well, is there any like happy medium between this? Can I like, you, can I do something you're different? You're right on the money. This is the conversation we're having all in our, uh, in our marketing uh, global. We all have our um, specific areas where are influencers in our own types of business. And you have that in finance, you have that in PR. In the marketing realm and the B2B realm, that is the conversation that's happening, right? I mean, the whole idea of being locked in for a year, that's a big commitment. And I think what we're seeing right now is that the, the, uh, um, the, the point of actually offering it on a monthly basis is, uh, is becoming much more, people are trying it. And I think it's still out. Um, I think you're going to see more companies allowing that to happen. So you're absolutely right. It's like, wait a minute, I'm locked in for a year. I want to cancel it, right? Uh, or, or they'll break. They'll try to break the contract. I've seen that happen. So let's. Um, I think for SaaS companies, in terms of uh, how we run things, we're trying all kinds of things. And exactly what you were mentioning, Brett, that is what we're trying to do. We're, we're actually offering. We're, we're testing some of those particulars where it's like, hey, you want to just you're on a freemium, but you want to try this out for a week. Well, okay, here, pay for a week, and you you have that whole access for the entire week. I, I think that that's that's what we're seeing. Gotcha, and then, I mean this kind of goes into like even SaaS or even just B two B P C is the customer experience because I feel like during the pandemic it was great for customer service. After the pandemic, it felt like customer service or customer experience kind of took a back seat. Everybody's like, we don't really got much customer experience professionals, so we'll get to you kind of maybe sort of. So how do you create that robust inbound outbound when, I mean, it's hard to find talent basically. Yeah. I think you hit it on the head. I mean, we're looking at high inflation. We talked about it earlier, but we're looking at some of the lowest amount of unemployment um, in the country, right? We, I mean, California is at 3.7 or 3.8. Um, the country right now is at 3.6 or, or that. Um, it's worldwide. I was just in the UK and actually in Israel and, and other areas um, out, out that way. And they're seeing similar, um, similar talent issues, right? How do, you, how do you bring people on board when there doesn't seem to be those people? So it's a challenge. I mean, really, quite honestly, I think um, in terms of like how we... Our, we call it on, on onboarding. It's to be as as um, as honest as possible, right? Uh, as best you can. I think in the retail side, it's much more um, it's much more acute. Um, in the B two B world, it is that onboarding side. Um, man, it, it's a tough one. I mean, it really is. Uh, it's a really tough one. I would say that it's everyone's job, though. 
right? It's just not the customer experience job. I mean, it's everybody's job. So how do I, as a marketer, help my customer experience teams? How do I help my sales teams? How do the sales teams help the customers as well? So I know that we want to talk a little bit about that um, and the, the importance of being aligned. I think that most companies are misaligned. Um, and that's not because uh, they're misaligned in terms of what the, what the product uh, is the the C level person will say it some way, the salesperson will say the product some way, the marketing person says it, and the customer service person. There's a lot of communication that's necessary between all these departments that need to happen so that you can answer that. So, for instance, you're right. If there are issues happening with customer service, how can marketing, how can sales, how can C level help that part of um, your your um, your team? It's no longer their issue. It's no longer my issue. It's everybody's issue, especially on a go-to-market uh, type of scenario. Gotcha. I mean, is it going to be more automation with it so it helps smaller teams that maybe can't afford a big team? Will automation help with directing them to the right team member? Now, I mean, sometimes it goes awry and the person doesn't really know where to go, but can it help most of that? Because I mean, you may not be able to fill everything, but you're like, well, maybe I have to go with automation and chatbots to at least yeah. facilitate where they should go. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think that those, these tools have a definite, definite um, a place in our um, ecosystem, right? Um, there's also self-help in terms of advocates who are absolutely uh people who are your champions for your your product they uh, being able to have i mean in this old world of forums i mean you have reddit areas you have places on even slack i mean we need to empower these power people to uh, actually help answer the questions they're part of the feedback loop that helps make our product better so not only in addition to these chats these other areas of place of areas that people go to i mean um, I heard, uh, if you recall, about a month ago, that whole TikTok that they, these uh, certain age group, people go on TikTok and look for, they search for things like, how do you do this? How do you do that? I mean, those are other avenues where you can help people. If, I think we've all been there when you're like, okay, my toilet broke. All right. It doesn't work anymore. You go on the YouTube or TikTok to kind of figure that out. Um, as um, companies, we need to look at the different avenues of where people, our people, our specific verticals go to have those question and answers. Not it doesn't necessarily come to us. They go out and do a search. They don't necessarily go to us. So I think, um, I think the challenge is multiple in terms of getting the right people and having the right tools and being in the right place. Gotcha. And then when you did mention like understanding your product, let's say your marketing director, should you have like your marketing people that be like okay. little mini experts in different areas? So at least they can point to somebody and maybe help facilitate the, the customer experience people. Because I mean, working at a peripheral gaming company, like I understood it well, cause I built computers, but a lot of the other PR people never touched like any of that stuff and didn't really understand it. And it, in some events, it was kind of embarrassing because they didn't really know what they were talking about. But is that is that part of the thing? Like you're the marketing director. You're like, look at you're gonna you're gonna understand this part. You're gonna understand this part. You're gonna understand this part because you can't understand everything. You know, especially if you have hundreds of products. Right. No, I I think that you need to have what we call subject matter experts, right? SMEs that are um, that know that product, um, and then you you have you have these product what I call product managers who are part of that process. And as marketers, uh, I, I see myself as like, we're just one part of that pie today. I mean, it used to be very defined, right? The PR people, the marketing people, the sales people. But today that that's very blurred. Um, and so you need to rely on this um, give and take uh, to, to, to be the product. I think the center of all that actually has to do with person who's buying your product or is using your particular product they are the person right they are the the um you know the champion that we need to go work with and if that is the center of where we're working on then then that communication becomes a lot easier to do so yeah you need to have you need to have these uh you need to have people who are um 
in specific areas know what this product will do. Um, but then the job is, okay, how do I communicate that? Or how do I provide that feedback to the marketing managers to improve a product, right? Yeah. And I mean, talking about customer experience, how, how can you measure this? Because PR pros are, we're, we're all about like relationships and managing just the brand reputation a lot of times. I mean, marketers do that as well. So how do you... How do you measure that to see how successful or where areas where you need to improve upon? How do you measure all that stuff to at least keep an eye those on are, Those are great, great question. I mean, and I'm not going to go into uh, abri- uh, to, um, to attri- uh, how do we attribute to, to things that that becomes a that becomes a, a black hole. And I think we would run out of time. I think that you, you, you use a okay, each each vertical that you're looking at. Um, uh, have a variety of different uh, methods uh, you, that you can use. You have a whole tool set. Yeah, I mean, you have like a, I, I call it a, a set of tools within your shed that you, you want to go ahead and do. Um, again, within that group of people, be it the C-level salespeople, we need to come to an agreement on what the type of KPIs we would measure success with. Otherwise, you come up and you're saying you become a vanity metric person. So um, with that set in mind, I mean, it's hard. Let's just be honest with that. It's hard to get up there and, and do that. Everyone's time is busy. But if you want longevity in your particular job, I mean, they say CMOs have like a two-year lifespan. You really need to be um, make people uncomfortable and, and to be part of that uh, agreement in terms of KPIs. So some of the KPIs I look for, net promoter score, right? Like how, um, how are people um, reacting to your... Um, your particular product or service, right? I mean, that's a pretty good benchmark that you can go and do, and you can you can use other benchmarks to kind of kind of figure that out. Um, journey analytics: how have um, how have the journey of, of of people on your website changed, um, particularly with your PR output or your you know the, your um, particular programs that you're having, right? Um, is there churn rate? Are there support tickets that you can take a look at that you've helped reduce or put in? A lot of this um, really uh, is um, part of like marketing, like actually having that baseline and understanding that. What I find is that most marketers or most companies today focus on a particular page, getting this up, and they're not really aware of how folks are interacting within their website or how I can reduce a 10-page visit to a four-page visit, right? I actually do in those journey analytics. When you have that in mind, then when you go ahead and do a program, you can actually measure that and say, hey, listen, I actually saw a bump in that piece that we put out on uh, a PR piece or uh, a podcast, let's say. Right? I saw a big jump in, in, in the amount of people coming and visit, uh, visiting my particular profile or coming to the particular page because they saw something or they downloaded something, right? Those, those are some of the important KPIs that I would look at, right? Journey analytics, right? make sure you have that. And that promoter score, right? take a look at that. Is your churn rate changed, right? Um, the other part is support tickets. So as you can see, all those things that we include sales, they include customer experience, they include marketing, and they include PR. So the importance of actually being very clear in communication, being the thorn in that organization to make sure that we're all communicating is a, a must. Uh, otherwise, again, in two years, they'll say, hey, marketing's not working. Thank you for your time. We'll hire another CMO. Mm-hmm. And does this kind of piggyback off just creating that clear lines of responsibility? Because part of that is this is your responsibility. This is what you do. Try not to deviate too much, but if you have to, that's okay. But this is what you have to do. So is it part of that to create that better customer experience? So at least people understand their responsibilities on how to basically have better customer experience. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also the challenge, what's being said. I mean, sometimes people come on board and um, and you'll see the list of, of duties that you have. I mean, they want you to be able to wipe the windows, uh, be able to feed the dog, uh, groom it, uh, the, you know, do the groceries and the cooking all, all at once. And sometimes you need to push back and say, hey, listen, this is a shared responsibility and um, this is how I see it and have those conversations to make that happen, right? So uh, you're, you're right. It is one of those things where, um, you know, the, the, the communication 
um, is the internal communication is as important as the external communication because um, you know your job or the company's success uh, is um, depends on it. So basically, I mean, for the top level stuff, it's actually, I guess you could say having core responsibilities and then having extra responsibilities if those core responsibilities are done. So you help the lower level people that are just trying to get stuff done, trying to make the company better, but you're not like overburdening them with, this is all your core responsibilities instead of doing like very strict, like core responsibilities. But if you have time, these are other stuff you can do. Right. I think if we divide those things into sta- um, strategic and, and tactics. Like in my particular role, my the importance part is to work with the upper level um, management, like C-level, and then my, my um, particular uh, salespeople and customer experience people and looking at this type of strategies and why. Then communicating that with people underneath who commit the tactics. It just makes sense for me to communicate that. And a lot of my success in terms of people... Um, buying into that is me communicating the reasoning why we're doing that so that people then are empowered when they're in that particular position to make the right decisions, right? Otherwise, then you become a micromanager, right? And they don't know it. It's sort of like having a date and and then that person getting mad and walking away and like, what did I do, right? It's like I didn't read that person's mind. Um, you, It's important to communicate with your teams and set the strategy and the reasoning why and how we look at that and then actually get some feedback because sometimes what happens is these people are right in front they're in the borderline and they can give the feedback back so i find that that communication which in with with my the first thing i do is like i go and i sit and i listen to customer service calls i'll look into see how it is i'll ask each of the departments of what our product specifically does and when i notice that there's differences then there's a problem with the alignment of the message Right. Like, hey, our people, the people who have our product, love our product. But then when I'm trying to sell it, they don't get the product. So there's a miscommunication there. And sometimes I uh, I'll go right away and I'll listen to hours of customer service. I'll listen to it. I become good friends with the customer experience person because he's right. He or she's right there speaking to these people, speaking to current people who are using it. So um, I really value their input. And when I go ahead and I talk about strategy, I make sure that they're part of that. So they just don't feel like there's this loose cork in the middle of an ocean moving around and uh, they don't, they feel like there's, you know, all they're doing is just pulling a lever. Uh, I mean, what are some, what are some ways that PR pros can collaborate with marketing? I know we said it's blurring a little bit more, which is true, but there's still a defined line. So where can we actually like collaborate effectively with marketing? So PR is, like trying to handle the reputation side and marketing is trying to handle the nitty gritty strategy side of sales and everything. In the past has always been, I remember like going into uh, working with my PR people. We used to have an in-house PR people and talking with them and it's all, they, they sort of looked at me skeptical, like, Oh, you're the marketing guy. Uh, and the, the, the marketing guy would look at the PR guy and like, well, they're not understanding our product. Um, it's changed, right? Uh, it's changed. Again, I feel that it really is this communication that's necessary. Like if I'm bringing the stress, as, as I discussed with the customer experience um, question you had, we need to do the same with the PR. When I'm out describing the product and what we're looking at, I need the PR's experience in terms of the connections that they have within the industry. Who are the influencers? How do I maintain this image, right? Because Um, a purchasing decision is based on a variety, especially in the B2B, it's a considered purchase, right? The person who's coming, it's a very different purchase um, journey from you and I who are coming in as a retailer where it's like there's an emotional attempt, although there is some of that in in B2B. Um, It's not a considered purchase unless your wife is saying you only have a certain amount of money or your partner's having a certain amount of money. It's not as big as a B2B where, um, Brett, I could be saying, Brett, I want you to look for this company to um, a new accounting software for us. You know, then your job is on the line in a lot of way. Your reputation's on the line. So that's the considered purchase part is a very important part. So as a marketer, right, I have to work with my PR team to um, to present ourselves as a, you know, a qualified uh, person for the need that this person is looking for, right? Making sure that I'm hitting, am I in G2? 
am I hitting influencers associated with our particular product? Is the press uh, that we're writing uh, particularly well? Are you being able to bring in third party um, um, people to, um, to look at our product and uh, accurately assess it, right? I mean, good or bad, right? So uh, I need to make sure that that strategy of how, what our product or service does is communicated to our PR firm so they know a direction. Otherwise, what I've seen before, some PR companies do is they just have a list of things and they're just going rote and then they bill you $7,000, $10,000 a month and you're like, okay, what did I get out of this? So um, it's important to communicate the strategy of the product or service, working and understanding what PR is because I've had I've had C-level people who who tell the PR person, hey, can't you just write like a PR uh, press release? And like the, the PR guy's cringing and I'm cringing like, mm, that's not, not how it works today. <laughs> You know, we there's it's a long game. Um, I look at PR as being my long game attribute, right? Where I'm looking about reputation, where I'm looking at consistency, where I'm building the brand, where right, there, where you're getting these other people who are um, they're my long term partners and working with SEO on our SEO side, right? And my content, like how do I get this particular piece out there to to look at as a thought leader? I look at them very very close in hand. But today, I still run into executives who just think of um, PR as just press releases. And that's hard. Yeah, I mean, it, unfortunately, PR does not have the best definition. <laughs> no one really understands the differences between them, and that's the hard part. Plus, with press releases, that's what PR is known for. So that's right. another that's another reputation that PR industry needs to actually like deal with. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean... But you're looking at it, I mean, good press sometimes means that there isn't any bad news of the company. So, like, if you're razzmatazzing, I mean, it's – you almost – consumers have become very, very adept of kind of look through – right? Like, this is – I'm sorry, but this is – and – um. But you have to look at the KPI, like, am I working for the consumer or am I working for the C-level? Honestly, I've had um, – where I uh, – where I've had to actually work with um, people in, in the executive suite and um, the executive, his KPI was, I want to be on this, this newsletter. I don't care if it doesn't get enough people. It was his own vanity, right? So, you know, you're looking at, okay, uh, my mission is for the direction of the service and the, and the product. But in this particular case, it wasn't, it was really toward the, this particular individual. So it's, it could put PR firms in a very difficult position uh, to do that. Plus, being the past 15, 10, 10, 15 years, I mean, social media and that blurring line between, wait a minute, shouldn't we be doing that? Or like, how's that work? Um, I, I, um, I feel for my colleagues, um, but I see them as an asset. Oh, 100%. If I have a PR budget, I'm really working um, that long term angle and earn trying to get my earned media uh, chops, right? I understand. Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes into the next question of like the blurring lines. How much more is it going to be blurring lines? Because marketers are like, should I be doing that? Or the PR people are like, should I be doing that? Are we now just like one team now? Is it just kind of like PR marketing? Because I mean, that's a lot of that's a lot of departments. It's PR marketing. It's not PR department, marketing department. It's PR marketing now. That's a great question, Brett. And I think it actually determines on what size company you are, right? Um, if you're blessed to have a PR division in your company and you're you know, north of $100 million, it's a different story than if someone has a, a $500,000 budget, right? Or, 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 or is not making that much or under a million dollars. You're looking at a different way of being able to communicate that, right? So um, it really, I hate to say it, it depends, on, it depends on where you fall on that. But the principles are the same. You're going to need to have everybody on board. Your product definition or your service has to be right on and everybody has to have sing the same song. So if we're not singing the same song, then there's going to be issues and then the pointing of the fingers. So communication by far is, is, is very important. And if you're a big company and you do not have your comms ready for uh, problems that could come up, you're going to be caught flat foot and you're going to be in the news for not the right reasons. I mean, we... We just saw some of that with, um, with um, I, I've been reading some of that with currently in, in the UK with the passing of the Queen. Certain people have been closing things when they're not supposed to be closing things and, and, and the, and the, and the uh, blowback has been 
quite big and that's just because they're just they're not uh they, they don't really have a comms team right so they sort of out of good interest or they're not really uh feeling it from uh you know communicating well with um the the people on the ground gotcha and then fun question for you where's the next place you you are going to travel because you've just talked about like a bunch of different places you like england and israel so where's the next where's the next destination? yeah this this year has been this year has been the revenge trips i mean i've been the peru this year uh i've been the mexico mexico city mexico turkey israel the uk my next place that I want to go to is Japan. I lived there for a number of years. It was some place I wanted to go just before the pandemic. So Japan will be the place that I'm going to go next and um, get back to seeing some friends and, and members of my wife's extended family. So Japan would be my next place um, to, to go. And they just lifted the restrictions for October, which is probably the best time. October, November is probably the best time to, to visit Japan and see the changing of the seasons. Nice. And then where can people find you online? They can find me on LinkedIn. So um, you do LinkedIn. I believe it's Mauricio Osorio. And if you look at uh, if a photo that I need to go ahead and change, the pandemic makes everybody go a little older. <laughs> but we're, but, we're, but you, if you look for me in my face there, that's who I am. Um, I am the only person with my full name, Mauricio Osorio. Uh, you, they can find me online and I'm looking, you know, reach out, say hello um you know, share some i thoughts and ideas I'm, I'm active in the marketing community in the b2b spaces as well so yeah, they can find me there nice and any final thoughts for our listeners i think that we are there that we always say that we're living in interesting times i think that we're we're seeing um the importance that much there's a I've said this throughout the theme, the importance of over communicating within your, you, within the internal teams to, to get your product messaging and service, right? So, uh, you know, if you're looking to uh, make a change within the company, if, if you see that misalignment, that's mostly where it's at, where you're looking at a product, a misalignment between product or service, where your executives are saying one thing and the salespeople are saying something, that's when you know you, you have a, uh, a time for hey guys we need to communicate and get this message correctly and and, uh, and do that when you do that then it becomes a, a little easier to go ahead and sell your product or service nice well th thank you mauricio for joining pr 360 and sharing your knowledge on b2b b2c marketing pr coffee tea <laughs> Travel tips. Uh, yeah, there there is something I do want to say about traveling. Right, if you're going to go to the UK, um, they've extremely adopted uh, touchless. So uh, if you go out and get some money, if you find it very hard to be able to get rid of it. So I, I had a lot of pounds that it took a while. So just make sure you have a, a credit card or something that you have because they will not be accepted. Uh, just letting you know about that. Uh, that was a big change then before the pandemic, or mostly I would say 90% of all businesses, at least in the UK, except even the buses all accept uh, uh, touchless. So just a travel tip for, for that. And don't forget to clean the lens on the back of your iPhone. A lot of people forget that they have, they're touching it all the time and just use their cloth and clean that little lens on your pictures will improve by a hundred percent. Well, even thank you for those travel tips as well. <laughs> no problems. Take care. Thank you for having me. And uh, well, I look forward to, um, you know, next time, hopefully. Yes. And thank you as always for listening. And please subscribe to PR360. Leave a five-star review on your favorite podcasting app. It really does help with the show. Let's get to number one on the business side of this. And join us next week as we talk to another great thought leader in the PR industry. All right, guys, stay safe. Get to understanding your customer experience and everything else in your company. And see you next week. Later.